The problem is if you start the book of Acts, but you really don't know the Gospels, and you can't really know the Gospels until you know the Old Testament. Not really. A lot of ministries, I, I was in a meeting earlier, and they'll take one verse of the whole Bible and expound with all kinds of topics and ideas and philosophies and um, you know things from recovery literature and like that. But the Bible stands alone. The Bible is the only book in the history of the world that claims to be the word of God. And it makes you all kinds of promises. If you read it, you study it, you hear it, you hold to it. No other book can do that. And so we are going to go into the book of Acts. But before we do, I thought it'd be a good idea to go through the book of Ruth. Now, anybody who knows the book of Ruth says, well, the book of Ruth is a love story. It is. But it is also the gospel in miniature. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that when I give you a background this morning. And then we're going to get in. I don't know, we're going to get very far into the book today because I want to cover uh, the background thoroughly because then we'll get to a place where we can uh, see Ruth uh, in, a, in a broader perspective. And if you can do that, then you're going to know that the book of Ruth is all about you. And uh, I don't announce this in public, but I found out that you happen to be your favorite subject. That being the case, <laughs> you're going to like the book of Ruth a lot. <laughs> So today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to start in the book of Ruth. It's only four chapters. We'll probably be in the book four weeks, five weeks tops. And then we're going to get into uh, to the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is going to be all about maturity because if you're familiar with that book, again, uh, the disciples become different people, different than they were when they were following Jesus for three years because the Holy Spirit comes on them. That alone may not have caused them to carry out the tasks that they did. But Jesus had been teaching them the word prior to that. So after knowing the word and then being filled by the Holy Spirit, these guys take off. And that should be the goal of every Christian. Good morning, John. Good morning, Joyce. Happy New Year to everybody. Talk to the people here on, uh, on Facebook. And so that's what we want to do, you guys. We want to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And, you know, everybody would agree that a relationship with Jesus Christ is a journey. I think everybody would agree with that. What people don't agree with is continuing on in the journey. And so what you find is a vast majority of Christians who are superficial Christians at best. What do you mean by that? Well, ask them what they believe and ask them why they believe that. And you will see that their answer is very short, very brief, very, very gray, not many facts there. Why is that? Because they really don't know what they believe because they really don't know the Lord. So listen, we don't want to knock uh, somebody in recovery especially if they're new to recovery. We don't want to knock somebody who's new to their, their Christian experience. And, and with that, I, I would say, you know, not to sound in, in, in any way insulting, but for any child, Camille and I have two brand new grandsons. At some point, they're going to go to preschool. At some point, they're going to go into kindergarten and, and first grade, like that little guy that's looking at me there sitting next to uh, or next to Jack. We're going to start them off with small steps, preschool, kindergarten, like that. But we're not going to leave them there, are we? If they decided that Jack's granddaughter should remain in preschool and kindergarten, let me tell you, social services is going to come in and they're going to take the baby away from Scott and Rebecca because they're going to say there's something terribly wrong. Well, what's wrong? Well, your son is 17 years old and he's still in kindergarten. This is not right. There are a lot of Christians that are that way. And so this ministry exists to take us further. And once you go just a little bit further, even if you don't go with us through the whole Bible, you're going to see that you're going to come to a place that God is going to start using you in a special way. And at that point, we probably won't see you here very often. And we're going to celebrate that. And we're going to pray for you. 
because the whole idea is for you to get out of this little classroom and get on to do the things that God called you to do. But you must be equipped. You must be equipped with the knowledge, being able to handle God's word. And of course, the filling of the Holy Spirit. So with that said, uh, the book of Ruth. Uh, the book of Ruth, of course, is a story uh, about a family of, of four. There's a father, the wife, and and two sons. And um, and then down the road, we're going to see that there are two daughter-in-laws involved. And that's when the story really begins to take off. And um, these uh, after we meet the two daughter-in-laws, there comes another uh, a guy by the name of Boaz. And Boaz is actually the hero of the story. So... Let me give you just a little bit of, um, well, historical uh, background where this book is concerned. Um, whenever you read a book, you always want to know a little bit about the author. At least I do, because I don't want to waste my time reading through a whole book where the author is sideways somehow, right? I'd rather read a book that has substance. Um, historically speaking, we don't know who the author of the book is. And what I mean by that, we don't know who put the pen to the paper. We do know that the Holy Spirit put this book in the Bible for sure. That'll become more clear to you as we move forward in the study of the book. But as far as the person who wrote it, some people say it was Solomon. Some people say it was the prophet Samuel. Nobody is quite sure. Uh, with that said, I'll tell you that in the whole Bible, women, ladies, you might find this interesting. But within the whole Bible, there are only uh, two books that are named after women. And one of them is Ruth, the book of Ruth, and the other is Esther. And not only that, but another little interesting uh, uh, fun fact, like my daughter likes to say, is that when you read the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, he lists the genealogy, all of the parents of Jesus. Now, if you know anything about Matthew, he was a Levite, very religious background that Matthew comes from. And any good Levite would never mention a woman where the lineage of Jesus is concerned, or, or for that matter, lots of stories in the Bible. But Matthew does because he's now a Christian and he's let go of a lot of the religious legal stuff. So he mentions four women in the genealogy of Jesus. And let me tell you something, just like the men that are mentioned, these four women have a scandalous reputation. And if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, Matthew names the first woman. Her name is Tamar. Now, Tamar was not a prostitute, but one day she posed as a prostitute for lots of reasons that we won't have time to get into here. Uh, that was a bit scandalous, but what even more scandalous is the day that she posed to be a prostitute, she also became pregnant by her father-in-law. Is that scandalous? Woof, that's bad. That's bad. But she's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The next woman that you meet, uh, you meet her in the book of Joshua. Her name is Rahab. She didn't pose as a prostitute. She was a prostitute. And not just a prostitute, a Gentile prostitute. But it turns out that a careful study of the book of Ruth reveals the fact that Rahab is also the mother of Boaz, who's the hero of the story here. Right? To get into a lot of different facets of the family of God in this book. Well, the next scandalous woman is Ruth, who is also kind of a hero uh, in, the, in the story of, uh, of uh, the book of Ruth. But she's scandalous because she was a Moabite. Anybody how, know how Moabites came to be? Do you remember Lot, Abraham's nephew? And after God judged Sodom and Gomorrah and he took off, went to hide into, the, into some caves there in the area of Zoar with his two daughters, who committed incest with Abraham. And out of that incestual relationship came the Moabite people. So when you read the beginning five books of the Bible, you find out that there was a curse uh, pronounced by God on the Moabite people. But here in the book of Ruth, 
is the story about Ruth and how God used Ruth. This woman who was a, a Canaanite, a cursed, comes from a cursed people. He uses her to save the Jewish people and us. Wait till we get there. And then last but not least is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she got pregnant before she was married. Isn't that the fact? So four women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, all of them uh, some kind of one way or another scandalous uh, reputation. And if you're like me, you sit back and you say, how in the world does God take a mess like this and work out salvation? Now, you know God, he, he could do whatever he wants, however he wants to do it. He chose to do it this way so that we would realize one day that there is, in fact, room in the family of God for all of us. And he is an amazing God. And that's one of the reasons we praise him the way that, uh, the way that we do. Well, two reasons that God included the book of Ruth in the Bible uh, first of all, it's a true story. And if you ever go to Israel, you'll see lots of evidence of this book, especially when you go to the town of Bethlehem, which we have been. Um, but there's two reasons that God included uh, the story of, of Ruth in, in the Bible. And uh, the first reason is because without this book, there would be no way to link King David with Jesus. You probably know that King David was... Uh, 28 uh, generations away from being the grandfather of, uh, of Jesus. Without this book, there would be no link, all right? Uh, the other reason that God included the book of Ruth in the Bible is because uh, through the events of the story of the book of Ruth, Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem, which is going to fulfill Bible prophecy. And also, for that reason, if you've ever been to Israel, if you've ever been to, to, to Bethlehem, you will see that it's it's not a big city. There's no skyline. Like if you go to downtown Los Angeles, when the sun goes down, you see these buildings, New York City, Shanghai, Hong Kong. These are major cities, import, export, billions, if not trillions of dollars pass through the hands of the people of these great cities, London. Um, so these big cities, Bethlehem is not like that. At all. In fact, to date, I don't think Bethlehem has more than 100,000 people in population. And uh, not a lot going on there, but to this very day, Bethlehem continues to be one of the most famous cities in all of the world. Why is that? Because that is where the Messiah was born. All right. With that, let me give you a little bit of a biblical history so we can come to that place where we get into the book of, uh, of Ruth. In the first five books of the Bible, we call it the Pentateuch. Jews call it the Pentateuch. We have uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. There, the Bible talks a lot about the story of creation. Uh, how God created the world, he created the heavens, the universe, how he created the Jewish people and gave them the nation of Israel. And so you read through those five books, and it's an amazing story how God pulls that off. But then you come to the book of Joshua. And in the book of Joshua, which would be the sixth book in the Bible, the Israelites enter the promised land. Remember, Moses couldn't get them to the promised land because uh, God found some fault in him and said, you know, Moses, you misrepresented me to the people. You made an angry face. You spoke some angry words when you gave them uh, my message. And I wasn't angry, Moses. So listen, you're not going to enter the promise. Now, I'll let you see it, but you're not going to enter in. No, Joshua is going to lead the people into the promised land. And that's exactly what happens. And so they get into the promised land. You know, they cross the River Jordan. They get in there and there is celebration. There are all of these promises of loyalty. God, I will be loyal to you as long as I live. The words that you speak, those words I will obey and all of these things. And they promise to be faithful. Then you come to the seventh book in the Bible. And that's the book of Judges. 
And when you come to the book of Judges, judge, uh, uh, judges, all of the excitement of being in the promised land, all the passion, it has now faded away. Just like some of us, we've been walking with the Lord for a while. We get bummed out. Our lives take a negative turn. And then God sends somebody to us and says, hey, what's going on? How are you? Well, you know, this happened and that happened and my life got turned around and then I don't know. And, then, you know, they said, when is the last time you read your Bible? Oh, well, it's been a while. When is the last time you went to church to fellowship with other believers? Oh, man, I think that was back in March. Have you been praying? Well, to be perfectly honest, I haven't been doing that either. And he said, well, that is the source of the problem. All the other stuff going on in your life, the way you feel, uh, that is symptoms of a deeper rooted problem. And so that's what happens to these people in the book of Judges. And in fact, twice in the book of Judges, God tells us the problem. He says that in those days, there was no king in Israel, so everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So that was the problem in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, a very sad story about the people of God who go back and forth. They have one foot in the world. They have one foot in God's word. That never works for anybody. Well, at that point, I love it because then you come to the eighth book in the Bible. Now, I'm not going to be the one to tell you that the Bible is in chronological order. It is not. But I find it interesting that the book of Ruth is the eighth book in the Bible because eight in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. And in the book of Ruth, which is really a continuation of the book of Judges, it becomes the highlight of the book of Judges because the book of Ruth is a beautiful love story where God works his plan even when his people are going through a dark time, even when his people are all messed up. Most of you are in recovery. You're recovering from drugs, alcohol, gambling, uh, sexual addiction, whatever it is. And I know from experience that you understand God working through dark times. God working his plan out through all the difficulties that we've created in our lives. So a lot of you guys are going to identify with this book in a big, big way. So all that to say that Ruth is a love story about a messed up family who made bad decisions. Actually, dad is the one who made a bad decision and the family just followed. And I, I want to emphasize that because those of us who are uh, husbands, those of us who are fathers, we have a very specific responsibility. And that responsibility is to know the word of God so that we can make family decisions based on the word of God. That is not your wife's responsibility. She'll do it. God will choose her to do it if you fail to do it. If your priority is something else, listen, God say, move out of the way, sissy. Excuse my language. Move out of the way, sissy. We'll get your wife to do the job of the man. I speak from experience. Camille was a lot more dedicated to the Lord and the word of God uh, for years before I finally came around. And I'm embarrassed of the fact that in the beginning, she led my children in the way of the Lord while I did not. All I would, all you could get out of me, squeeze me, take out every drop of blood. And all you could get out of me was Narcotics Anonymous and the literature that I found there and the things that people were sharing in the meetings, which didn't help my wife, my children, my family life a bit. Oh, but you were clean. Listen, that that is less than 1% of what life is about. The big deal in life is the word of God and all of eternity. So men, we have a very specific responsibility. Well, the father of, uh, of this family, he made a bad decision. And that bad decision went from bad to worse because after that, his two sons, uh, they fell from sickness and eventually uh, death. But I said this was the highlight of the book of Judges. After that happened, 
through a marriage between a Hebrew man named Boaz and a Gentile, a Moabite woman named Ruth, God saves the family. So uh, from close up, uh, this book, you know, you could say it reveals the heart of God and the way he, you know, saved the family through all of the family's mess, a family that was in crisis, if you want to say that. But then you step back and from a broad perspective, this story is really a picture about us because we're a messed up people. And we've made lots of bad decisions that have affected us in a negative way that led us to sickness and death many times. But through a marriage between a Hebrew Messiah, us Gentiles and some Jews have been saved. And so it's interesting that in this story, Naomi, who is the wife, is a picture of Israel. You're going to want to keep that in mind as we go through the book. She is a picture of Israel. Boaz, the guy who ends up being the hero of the story, is a picture of Jesus. And Ruth, you got it, is a picture of us. So that's the way this book rolls. And if you keep that in mind, it's going to make a lot of sense. I'll remind you as we continue moving forward in the book. And of course, um, Ruth learns about the God of Israel through her mother-in-law, Naomi. Understand that. Naomi's Jewish. She's a Hebrew woman. Made some mistakes, but it doesn't take away from the fact that she's still a Hebrew, a Jewish woman, an Israelite. Ruth is a Moabite. She's a Gentile. Let me say it again. Ruth learns about the God of Israel, the one and only true God, through Naomi. Later on, Ruth and Boaz have a son. His name is Obed. Okay, we'll get that in the last chapter. He becomes the grandfather of King David. After 28 generations, King David becomes the grandfather to Jesus. Why do I mention that detail? Because in a sense, if you step back and look at this, Naomi, the Israelite, the Jewish woman, the Hebrew, she offers her God to Ruth, the Gentile. But then in return, because Ruth has a child that becomes the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus, in return, Ruth offers the Messiah to Naomi. And we'll catch that in the last nine verses of, uh, of the last chapter of the book. But again, that tells our story, doesn't it? If, you listen, if you're listening carefully, have just a little bit of Bible experience, you know that that tells our story. Because Israel, the Jewish people, introduced us to their God. That's right. I said their God because he was their God first. We didn't know anything about this God. We knew nothing. We were pagans. We were messed up. Oh, higher power. We were worshiping rocks. Imagine that. You're, if you're a Gentile, your ancestors and my ancestors, they were worshiping rocks and animals and the moon and Venus and Mark. Crazy stuff. But God touched the Jewish people. He introduced them to the one and only true God. And then we learned of that God through them. In essence, they introduced us to their God. And then through their God, we met our Messiah, Jesus, who they reject. Jewish people overall reject their Messiah. But in the future, we just got through finishing the uh, study of the book of Revelation. In the future, during the seven years of tribulation... Israel is going to realize that Jesus is their Messiah, the one that we, us Gentiles, preached about, we taught about, we proclaimed. That same Messiah is also their Messiah. So they introduced us to God, to the real God. We introduced them to the Messiah, and that's what we find in this book. So when it's all said and done, one day we're all going to look back and we're going to realize that Israel, the Jewish people, introduced us to their God, and we Gentiles introduced them to their Messiah. And so in many ways, the book of Ruth is not just a love story, it's a prophetic book. 
And that's why as we read through the book, you're going to see the words redeem, redeemer, redemption. Those words are mentioned more than 20, 23 or 24 times, I believe, in just four chapters. Because the book of Ruth is not just a love story, but it's a love story that speaks of our redemption. What do I mean by redemption? Well, in this case, you could call it recovery from sin. You could call it restoration to our original standing with God. Remember, the Bible begins with a beautiful garden. People pure, no sin at all, perfectly in love with God. The last two chapters of the Bible end with beautiful, sinless people in a garden, truly in love with God. Everything in the middle is a mess. And so that brings me to another uh, point. If, if you were to ask people, even people that are somewhat familiar with the Bible, if you were to ask them, what is God's greatest work? What is God's greatest accomplishment? If you were to ask that question to most people, they would probably say, well, that has to be creation. I mean, God spoke the world into existence. And then he said, let there be light. And then he separated the light from the darkness, the sun and the moon and earth and the animals and human beings. I mean, have you ever looked at how a human being lives and exists in all the intricate details and all of these things? Well, that's true. That, that was a, the creation was a great accomplishment by God. But when you read the Bible and you step back, it's only, you know, what I think Genesis, uh, some of the Psalms, the book of Job, Isaiah, those books, they mentioned the creation and they mentioned it briefly. And what did God sacrifice when he created all of creation? He sacrificed six days. Now, what it says in, in, the, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2? Took him six days. On the seventh day, he rested. So it cost him six days for all of creation. But where our redemption is concerned, what did God sacrifice? His son. And the entire Bible, in one way or another, mentions that over and over and over again. In fact, somebody said, I don't know, it's been repeated a lot of times since, but somebody at one point said that in the Old Testament, Jesus, our Redeemer, is predicted. In the Gospels, he's revealed. In the Acts, he's preached. In the Epistles, he's explained. And in the Revelation, he's expected. The whole Bible speaks about how God saved us. The sacrifice that he made to redeem us. Why does God say that over and over and over and over and over and over again? Because it proves his love for us. Now, we live in a very superficial world. So the word love is tossed around all over the world. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. Did I tell you that I love you, I love you, I love you? Let me hug you, I love you so much. I love you, I love you, I love you. But the truth is, love is an action word. And so by God's action, his love is evidenced when he sent his son to save us. Believe me. That's not something that he was excited to do in one sense. He was excited to save us, but it broke his heart. There was more pain that could be measured when he had to send his son to earth, to this messed up place to save a messed up people. Well, that's our background. We're going to go ahead and we're going to jump into the book of, uh, of Ruth now. And before we do, we're going to begin the way we always begin, and that's with a word of prayer. So let's bow our heads and ask God to teach us. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for those who have joined in uh, to study this beautiful book, your word, your word. Thank you for the sacrifice that they make to set aside an hour, an hour and a half on a Saturday morning, Saturday evening for those in England and Sweden to see what you have to say, because there is nothing that promises transformation of life from this temporary world into the eternal world the way your bible does there is nothing that changes our mind and changes our heart the way your word does and so we ask you to go before us to teach us we ask you to remove anything that hinders us including the sin lord and we are guilty 
of sin. We sin in thought, we sin in word, and we sin in deed. And we ask you to forgive us, to clear our minds, to make us like dry sponges, Father, to soak up every bit of what is your word, the promises that are there. The way you speak to us, Lord, like in dimensions, there is the story close up. There is a story from a broad perspective. And there is in all of that evidence of your love. That's why we praise you. That's why we become excited. That's why emotions become stirred. Not because there's a lot of happy hallelujah, amen, praise God, glory to God, hallelujah, jump around, dance, wave the flag. Not for those reasons, but because of what you've done and how your word describes it from so many perspectives. The God who created the universe truly loves us. And from this life, we will go on to experience eternal life in his presence in heaven. That is worthy of celebration every day of our lives. Forgive us, Lord, when we worry, when we fear, when we rebel. Help us to be more consistent in this journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Remember, I told you the book of Ruth is a continuation of the book of Judges. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, you might want to underline that, it's going to repeat it in a minute, went to dwell in the country of Moab. Now, if, if you know about, if you've ever seen a map of Israel, you see that Moab is on the opposite side of the Jordan River. In fact, Moab today is the country of Jordan. So there was a uh, famine in the land, and uh, we'll see in a minute. This guy moves his family to the other side of the Jordan because there's food there, all right? It says, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And so there you see it mentions it again. So, in the first two verses, twice Bethlehem of Judea is mentioned because the events of this story are going to fulfill the prophecy that is written about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. Why does God emphasize that? Well, because God knew beforehand that there were a lot of people that would say, this is hogwash. This man named Jesus that was born in Bethlehem is the savior of the world. I'm not going for that old stuff. I don't even know where Bethlehem is. It's no Shanghai. It's no Los Angeles. It's no London, New York City. None of those things. I'm not going for that. God, in anticipation, fulfills the prophecy of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. Because that is a long shot. If the Messiah was born in London, of course he's the Messiah. But no, he's born in Bethlehem. In the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, it was written, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judea, even all of the cities of Judea were bigger than little Bethlehem, he says, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. Yes, Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem, and he was. He was born physically, but it, Mike, Micah makes it clear that Jesus was around long before he was ever put into the body of a man. He is eternal God. Now, when you study the Bible, you find out that there were some say 13, some say 14 famines mentioned in the Bible. Every one of those famines came 
because of God's judgment. And so I mentioned, and I'll mention it again, in, in the book of Judges, in, in chapter 17, verse 6, and chapter 21, verse 25, it says two times in the book of Judges, in those days there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So the famine that took place during the, the time of Ruth is probably because of the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel at the time. They were going back and forth, a very dark time in Israel's history. I mention that because we need to remember that our God is patient, he's loving, he's merciful, he's not quick to judge, he's slow to anger, the Bible says. But there does come a time when God will chastise his children. And the New Testament talks about it, and we see it in the Old Testament. Listen, if he didn't do that, then he would not be a, a God worthy of the title Father. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather now. I believe in discipline, disciplining children after you've given them chances. You, you got to put your foot down. Otherwise, uh, they go, you know, to a bad place. And so God does that. And that's what we see him doing here with his children uh, at the time of the uh, of the book of, uh, of Judges. The other thing that happens when God chastises us is he breaks us, doesn't he? And I'll tell you, I was going through a thing over the last uh, month or two um, where I was really struggling. And there were things going on and there was just more and more and more pressure. I started to isolate. Man, I even called my sponsor. Uh, I was praying desperately. I called Jack. And man, what is going on with me? And there were some things that I could have pointed at, but uh, that would not have led to the level of emotions and, and sadness and just really brokenness that I was experiencing. And then about a week or two ago, <clears throat> God brought me to the other side of that. And wow, wow, I saw things from a whole different perspective. Everything about me changed. It was a time of brokenness, which led to growth. And that's one of the reasons why God doesn't allow us to get away with things that we have no business practicing. So lots of reasons for that. Now, if you live in Sweden, I see my brother Christopher there. <laughs> if you live in England, <laughs> or if you're from the United States, he, none of us are over 100 years old, so we would not really know what it's like to go through a famine. But a famine is really, it's not like a recession. It's not like a... Uh, um, it's not like a depression. It, it, during those times, uh, there's no money, there are no jobs, but there is food. Uh, when there is a famine, there is no food. Uh, a while back, Dr. Bruce Beloyan, he's a retired uh, Bible college professor over at Azusa Pacific University, good friend of our, our pastors, and I'm proud to say my good friend. He came to the church and he preached. And we noticed as soon as he came out from the back after worship, Man, he lost what looked like 50, maybe up to 100 pounds. And we said, well, and I remember looking at Camille saying, oh, no, Dr. Bruce is sick. I wonder what's going on. Well, he wasn't sick. What happened is he had just come back from the mission field. He apparently visits a, a, a mission field in Africa once a year. And these people have very little food. They only eat once a day. And he said that whenever he goes there, he cannot bring himself to eat more than once a day. He's not going to eat more food than they're eating. He also said that at night, they chew on these sticks, not because these sticks have any nutritional value, but because they kill the hunger pain. <clears throat> and I bloom. In fact, that when <clears throat> he shared that with us almost 20 years ago. I've never forgotten that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> famine is bad. And in this story, Elimelech, the father of the family, <coughs> Naomi, and their two sons, they leave Bethlehem. All right? I want you to catch that. They leave Bethlehem to go to Moab. Strangely enough, we'll talk about it more in a few minutes, but Bethlehem means house of bread. And there ain't no bread there. 
and they leave the house of bread to go to a foreign country. Remember, the Moabites are a cursed pe people, but they go to the land of Moab to find food. Now, before we go further, I, I got to mention this. If you're a student of the Bible, and I understand the vast majority of Christians are not students of the Bible. But if you're a student of the Bible, you understand very early on that every word of the Bible, every name that you find in the Bible, every detail that you find in the Bible is there by the design of God. Because the Bible says that it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So God found a way to put these names, these events, all these details, every word in its place because it is a message that is in dimensions, many dimensions as a matter of fact. We're going to see that in this book. And so the name Elimelech means God is my king. At some point after he was born, Jewish people, they used to name their children after they were born. We have a tendency to name them before they were born. But in Jewish culture, they would watch the child. They would pray. And then they would give the child the name that matched his personality or an event in that child's life. So sometimes kids weren't named even after a year. So Elimelech's uh, name is God is my king. The name Naomi means pleasant. And check this one out. My loan means unhealthy. This child was born. Mama Naomi looked at him and said, oh, man, he's got problems. Maybe he was crippled. Maybe he had an erratic heartbeat or a breathing problem. I don't know, but it means unhealthy. And then Kilion means puny or small or sickly or weak. Could mean any of those things. But one way or another, he also had a problem. <clears throat> well, starting with Elimelech, his name is actually a contrast because as it turns out, uh, God was not king in his life, which reminds me of a lot of Christians I know, and I'm not trying to criticize them or shoot them down, but I mention this over and over again because I don't want you guys to become this. But I have met a lot of Christians who say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. Hey, can you tell me something about Jesus and why I should feel the way you feel? Why I should express my faith the way you express your faith with all of this excitement and passion and jumping up and down? Why? And they can't really answer you. We talked about that in the beginning. They don't really know what they believe. They don't know why they uh, believe it. Oh, but they'll say, God is my king. All right. Well, Elimelech means God is my king. But when the famine came, when crisis came, turns out God was not his king. Why do you say that, Mario? Because he ran. He ran from the place that God calls the house of bread to a land of accursed people. I don't see God being his king. I see him as a runner. In recovery, we call that pulling a geographic. Hey, you know, I use drugs. My drinking is out of control, whatever. So I'm going to move from Los Angeles to Idaho. And then my problem with drugs and alcohol will be over with. Well, no, because wherever you go, there you are and you're the problem. And so Elimelech's uh, geographical change didn't make things better. In fact, it made things worse, not just for him, but for his whole family. You know, some people, I always talk about how bad California is, and California is bad. California is the essence of spiritual darkness. And people ask me, well, Mario, are you going to move to Texas? Everybody else is moving to Texas. You moving to Idaho? Everybody moving? You moving to Tennessee? Everybody's moving to Tennessee? Well, no, I'm not moving. Why not? Well, God hasn't told me to move. But it's so dark, Mario. Yeah, but God hasn't told me to move. God is my king, no matter how I might feel at the moment. And uh, so in this case, uh, Elimelech's name is actually a contrast. Now, as it turns out, his son's name happened to be prophetic. We'll see that when we get to verse 5, because shortly after Elimelech dies, and we're going to see that in a minute, both of his sons die. And all that is left at that point is his wife, Naomi, and two 
daughter-in-laws, all right? And so uh, regarding Naomi's name, that her name means pleasant. And, and for the moment, it seems also to be a contrast. But when we get to verse 6, we're going to find out. Naomi made a, may, may have made a mistake following her husband early on to Moab. But she returns to Bethlehem to the house of bread. And God blesses her in ways that she cannot even imagine. In a way that her life is beyond pleasant. We're going to see that. man. This book blows my mind. Uh, but for now, their situation is going to go from bad to worse. Let's keep reading. Uh, look at the second part of verse 2. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Famine in the house of bread, the land of Judah. But they found out, hey, there's food in Moab. I realize these are accursed pagan people. But there's food there. We're going. So verse 3, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Wow. Took his family all the way to Moab where he had no business going. And there he dies. So he misleads them and then he dies. Misleads them and then leaves them. And she, that is Naomi, was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. Oh, my goodness, if you know the Old Testament, you say, no, 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 don't do it. Don't marry those women. They are outside of the family of God. Guys, there's going to be nothing but problems. Don't do it. You know, tomorrow, I'm going to officiate a wedding of a wonderful young couple. And they called. They said, Mario, can you marry us? I said, of course, I'll marry you guys. But listen, I never do that without premarital counseling because I know how rough marriage, marriage can be. And the only thing worse than that is divorce. And so we did mar uh, premarital counseling. What do I do in premarital counseling? Very simple. I take the Bible where it speaks of marriage and we compare it to their lives, to their past experience, to their present relationship with the Lord, and we see how it matches up. The Bible itself will find its way into revealing all kinds of problems in their life. And that's what we did. They were surprised to realize they had issues that could become a great obstacle in their marriage. But we talked about those issues, how they would handle them, how they would not handle them what God had the capacity to do. And they decided after all of that, now their eyes are open, Mario, we still want to get married. And I said, all right, I tried my best to discourage you, but you still want to get married? So I will be thrilled to marry you guys. And that's what we do in premarital counseling. In essence, what we want to find out is both the groom and bride-to-be are actually part of the family of God. Because if not, they're going to be unevenly yoked and it's going to be a disaster. Talk to anybody who's been divorced. They can tell you all about it. But these guys, they went and they married these Moabite women. Let us never discount the love and the power of God even when we disobey God. Wait till we get to the... Uh, middle of the story but for now she was left with her two sons now they took wives of the women of moab the name of the one was orpah and the name of the other was ruth and they dwelt there about 10 years so the husband dies and for about 10 years they remain in moab and these two young guys are married to these moabite women but then look at this both malon and kilion also died. Can you imagine the grief of Naomi? Wow. And so the women survived her, or so the woman, that is Naomi, survived her two sons and her husband. Well, we're not going to get any farther than, than this. We're going to leave this here for now. And I would imagine, saying, wow, this is a, what we call a cliffhanger, right? <laughs> but you can read on ahead. I hope that you will. And then we're going to, uh, get into the, the, the probably the next chapter by next week. But for now, I just want to share something with you. And that is that this is a very tragic 
family story. In fact, it seems at this place where we stopped that it's almost an entirely hopeless situation. You know, with uh, Naomi, her, her husband is gone, her sons is gone, and Naomi is completely broken. You know what I have found out over the years, experience after experience with God? is that brokenness is just the beginning of bliss in my relationship with the Lord. And we're going to see that uh, in this story. It's just the nature of things when you walk with the Lord. And here, Naomi is completely broken. So you know what she's going to do? Exactly what God wants her to do. She's going to return to Bethlehem. If you ever in your experience walk away from God, as long as you have breath in you, it's never too late to return. And it is not a process. It's not a journey. Don't let anybody tell you, well, before you do that, you need to work all 12 steps again. No, you don't. That might be where recovery philosophy, man-made philosophy is, is concerned. But where the Bible is concerned, you just get on your knees, you pray, and God awaits you with open arms. There is no process to returning to God. Naomi returns to Bethlehem, and God will bless her life in ways that she can't even imagine. So until next week, or hopefully as you read through the rest of the story, <clears throat> I want you to keep something in mind, and that is that Elimelech's family is from Bethlehem, Judea. Bethlehem, Judea. That is not by mistake. Judea or Judah, as some people call it, means praise. Bethlehem means house of bread. In the Bible, bread is always symbolic of the word of God. Remember Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. And all the way through the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, bread is always a picture of the word of God. It's always symbolic of the word of God. And in the Psalms, King David, Jesus, great, 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 great grandfather, he wrote, these words in Psalm 119, verse 105, longest chapter in the Bible, by the way. David said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's what David said. Whenever a person sets their mind, sets their heart on the word of God, their focus, their decisions, their direction, their all going to lead to a place of praise to God, which is going to lead to a place of intimacy with God, which is going to lead to a place of obedience to God. When we get to that place, no matter what crisis comes into our lives, we will not be moved because when we get to that place, God will truly be our king. How do you react to crisis? Do you get angry? Do you blame people? Are you a runner? Hmm? You say, you know, things don't look good here, but I could see over there the grass sure looks greener. Are you that kind of a person? Listen, if you are, it is probably evidence that you are not residing in the house of bread. That is that the word of God is not your focus for direction, for making choices, decisions. The word of God is not really the center of your mind and your heart. I've met so many people. It's the word of God. Yeah, Mario, but it's also my recovery literature, but it's also, and I say, well, which one is determining the direction of your life? Well, Mario, you know that recovery has to come first. Well, that's interesting because the Lord said, seek first God and his righteousness, and then these other things will come to pass. So I'm not saying recovery literature is not good. I'm saying that should be secondary, not first. Sometimes I hear people that are Christians, they speak of recovery literature and listen to them. 
because that's the authority in their life. The word of God is secondary. It should be the other way around. The problem is they don't live in the house of bread. They haven't come to the place where the word of God is in the center of their mind and their heart. Unfortunately, when that's the case, there won't be much praise to God, not true praise. They might stir the pot emotionally, but not true praise. And then, of course, there's no intimacy with God. And then, of course, obedience to God is lacking. Once again, because truth be told, God is not their king. Something else is their king. That's not what God wants for our life, because God wants us to be successful in everything that we do. And there's only one way to do that. We don't know the future, but we know the God who knows the future. And if we put our hand in his hand, not his hand in our hand, but if we put our God in, if we put our hand in his hand, he gets to lead the way. And though we don't know what tomorrow holds, and we don't know how to interpret crisis, he does. Don't move until he says to move. And be, men, be leaders of your home. And don't say that you're a leader just because you feel like a leader because you got the muscles, because you can bench bench 300 pounds and she can't. That has nothing to do with because you can make babies. No. You can call yourself a leader when you are invested in the word of God, when you know the word of God, and you can lead your family in that way. Generation after generation. You know, it seems like nothing. Maybe it's just cute, somebody might say. But uh, one of our grandsons, the one who's uh, 19 months, the one who's younger, he doesn't know better yet, but we're teaching him. But the one that 19 is 19 months, little Jonah, say, Jonah, where is Jesus? He lifts his hand, he points, and he says, Jesus. He said, no, 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 Jonah. Where is Jesus? One word, and he points to his chest, heart. You say, well, Murray, he's only 19 months old. Yeah, but we're teaching him. Teach them when they're young. Tell you something else. We learned when we went to Israel. And that is that Jewish mothers all through the Old Testament and even today, they and, and their fathers, they don't wait till the baby is out of the womb to teach the baby. They put their mouth to mama's tummy when the baby's in the womb. And say, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. They teach him while they're in the womb. My wife was doing that when our grandsons were in the wombs of their mothers. Teach them when they're young. But if we're going to do that, we've got to know the word. And ladies, if you're married to a man who has no interest, maybe he's already run off. Maybe he left you behind. That, that, that is... Uh, unfortunately very common um then you have that responsibility and it's okay because god is with you and he'll lead you in all of those things so he, a beautiful god that we served and when it seems like there's no hope at all that can be found oh there is god and there's plenty of hope in him so this book of ruth it blows my mind i guarantee be consistent Come back next Saturday. I don't care if you do it on Facebook or on Zoom. But come back and go with us through the book of Ruth. It will be the highlight of your life. I guarantee it. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Lord, you are an incredible God. And we don't say that just because we're stirred with emotion. We have seen you work. We have heard your voice. And if somebody should say, well, you call yourselves Christians. You call yourselves knowing the Bible and God is with you and you heard his voice and you've seen him. What does he look like? Well, we really can't say that we've seen him with our eyes. We really can't say that we've heard him with our ears. But what we can say with all assurance is that his fingerprints are surely all over our lives. Because we've been through crisis. He has chastised us. He has, uh, he has spanked us. He has broken us. And he has restored us. Some of us many times over. And that is not human activity. 
And that is not a human result. That is supernatural. It is the God of the Bible who is going to take us to great, great places as we continue to journey on. You want to see it clearly? Study his word. You want to be superficial? Just enjoy the emotional ride. You can be excited and superficial. Father, give us a heart to want more of you, to never stop wanting more of you that comes only through your word. And for those who are parked, who are stuck, who are in, maybe they think they're in neutral. Father, we ask you to shake them. Allow experiences in their life that will bring panic, that will bring scarcity, that will bring crisis, whatever you have to do to draw them to yourselves, because we understand that it is safe and it's going to have eternal consequences. Thank you, Father. Lead us on through this wonderful book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, I'm going to end uh, Facebook, and then we're going to go to questions and comments. And I hope that the, the questions and comments will be in regards to this book, because uh, we want to know how it affects your mind, your temperament, uh, situations in your life. So, uh, Alma, uh, Wilkes, Lillian, all of you, John, God bless you guys. Hope to see you again next week. Okay, turn off the recorder.